everyone, my name is Nathan Nelson. Uh, if you didn't know, I, as he just said, I was a youth pastor up here in International Falls for a little bit. I'm getting close to the camera, sorry. Uh, so um, I was a youth pastor up here for two and a half years and uh, got to meet a lot of great people here, a lot of familiar faces even in this room right now. And so it's really good to be back. I was telling my wife, even as we were driving into town, that it just brings back so many nostalgic feelings driving through the town and driving past some of the old hunting spots that I had up here. So it's good to be back, and it's good to see you guys. Um, so a little bit of background on me. I was fortunate enough to be raised in a home where hunting was a big thing. My dad took me out in the woods from the time when I was really little. Uh, four, five, six years old, he'd have me out in the woods, and we'd be doing some scouting together. He'd also bring me out in the woods on some of his hunts when I was young. So I've been around it for a long time, and my dad is a very good hunter, so he taught me a lot about it. Um, now, as I was growing up, I shot a few decent eight-pointers uh, and nine-pointers. This, this was the biggest buck that I had shot when I was, uh, you know, from the time when I started till, through high school. Uh, shot that one with a bow. Um, you know, so I've got some, I've got some, I had some really good land that I was able to hunt on my uncle's property. You know, mostly all private land type of situation and was able to have some really good memories and good experiences with all of that. Then when I went to college, I uh, didn't get to hunt at all for like three years, and it drove me crazy. Uh, you know, so when I got the job up here in International Falls, I was just like ready to go, uh, looking forward to being out in the woods and doing some hunting. And uh, the Jellies were really good about letting me get in and do a lot of hunting with them. Uh, and so I got to have some great memories with them as well. And I did a lot of public land hunting as well during that time. So that's kind of the time in my life when I, you know, I, I learned a lot about hunting growing up. But basically where I really started to take it myself and really learn and, and run with it was when I came up here to International Falls. And there's two things that I really learned first of all, about hunting in the Northwoods of Minnesota. It's flippin' difficult. It is so hard. Like, if you can get big bucks in northern Minnesota consistently, you are like one of the best hunters on the planet. They're, the deer numbers are not real great. There's not a whole lot of big bucks. So if you can do it, you, you know what you're doing, and you've got some things figured out. So that was the first thing that I learned. The second thing that I learned is that even though there aren't many deer, there's some very good ones. Uh, and I'm going to pull up some pictures of some of the different bucks that I was hunting when I was up here. So first of all, this is me and my wife, my wife here, Nicole. Let's give it up for Nicole. Uh, and also, on a little other cool side note, I wanted to tell you guys that we are expecting a baby in October. So we're pretty happy about that. But yeah, this is a, this is a buck that I shot two years ago. Um, but this is, I'm going to go into some of the deer that I hunted up here in International Falls. And I'm doing this not to like, like brag about my trail camera pictures. What I'm doing is I want to show you, this is the type of caliber of deer that we have in this area. And there's bigger ones than this. This is a buck that I hunted for uh, each year that I was up here. Um, and he is a buck that I call Dreamer. Absolute giant. To this day, he still haunts me. Probably the biggest deer that I've ever hunted uh, in all of my life. So he was probably about 160 inch buck. Just incredible. Now this one here is a buck that I uh, had on camera that I was hunting called D2. So that's just a little glimpse of him there. It's kind of been a little glitchy with this, but you get the picture. This is another buck that I was hunting called Sleeping Giant. I actually, the story behind this deer was I was in the spot, dozed off uh, during the middle of the hunt, and as I'm walking out, there's big tracks that cross right behind me. So that's where he got the name Sleeping Giant. He walked about 20 yards behind me. He actually has like, he had like a 21 inch spread, just, just huge. He was a monster. Uh, this is another buck that I hunted that I called Ghost. We'll see if this one works here. So that's another nice buck, big body on him. This is another one. This is a buck I called Sapling. I actually had an encounter with this buck. 
Uh, I'll tell that story a little bit later. This is uh, uh, just the coolest old deer that I ever got on camera when I was up here. I call him Old Nasty because he was just the ugliest looking deer I ever got on camera. He looks like he's like 14 years old. Just an ancient deer. So that, so that is the deer that I had on camera. And, and once again, I'm just showing that just so that you know you don't have to go down south. You don't have to have a big expensive farm somewhere. You don't have to do anything to be able to hunt big bucks other than just go out your back door, put in the work, and you can be on some absolute giant deer. Now they're few and far between and you got to work harder to get on them, but there are some big deer here in northern Minnesota. And I don't know if you know this, but there are actually people from all over this country that travel to this area to hunt this area, specifically more like tracking bucks in the snow and, and doing other forms of hunting like this. But a lot of people come up here for this. The last number of years, uh, basically from the time that I uh, moved up here, I've immersed myself into learning as much as I possibly can about big woods deer and hunting big woods deer. And it is quite a challenge. Uh, you know, it is, it is really a very difficult thing, but it's been starting to pay off. Um, you know, the, the knowledge that I've been gaining and the experiences that I've been having and the time that I've been putting into it, I've been starting to have some success. And in fact, two years ago, this buck right here that I shot was in the big woods of northern Wisconsin. I, I, uh, I shot that buck at about 30 yards, um, and uh, it was the very first big mature deer that I'd ever shot. And so uh, that one is uh, one that I'm very proud of. And if you want to watch the hunt, you can actually go on YouTube, and I have a YouTube channel where you can view the whole entire thing. So that's when I really uh, started to have some success in what I was doing. And then last year, I was hunting in an area, um, and I, I ended up uh, hitting, hitting a 140, 150-inch 10-pointer, really giant deer. Uh, but I, the angle was so steep that I, I only hit one lung and we tracked him for about a mile, couldn't find him. But I ended up getting this buck last year, that one right there. So it's, it's been, it's been kind of slowly progressing and, and uh, really having uh, some good success here as of late. And I'm, I'm hoping to keep that going. And just some of it's just been learning different areas and how to hunt different areas. So... Um, uh, the goal for this time that I have here with you guys is this. This is what I want you guys to realize. This is what's going to be what this whole entire time is about, is this. I want to help you guys get after and hunt down some big woods bucks, okay? That is my goal for this time, is that you will learn some things to help you be able to get closer to some big deer. So we'll just jump right into it. The key to big woods hunting is this. You need to be where that deer is at. Not where he was. You need to be where that deer is. It doesn't matter if that deer was walking through that area midnight on your trail camera. That don't mean a hill of beans. You're too far away from where he's actually moving in daylight. You need to be where he is. And this is kind of a, a, a challenge in the big woods because I don't know if you guys have ever been a little overwhelmed by how much woods there is. They could go just about anywhere. So it's kind of a, it's a big challenge to be able to get in on some of these deer. But here's the thing. If you're hunting the same spot 10 years in a row and you maybe only get trail camera pictures of a buck that's coming through in the middle of the night and you've never seen a buck in 10 years, you're wasting your time in that spot. The big woods is filled with so many dead zones that you have to find where is the hot spot to be at. You have to find where are deer moving in daylight? Where are they living? You gotta be close to it or else you're gonna be so far out of the game that you're not even gonna have a chance. The only thing that's an exception to this is during the rut. During the rut, bucks will be cruising. They'll go outside of their normal areas. They'll be moving during the middle of the day, going from doe bedding area to doe bedding area, checking out these places. Uh, so you can get lucky in those times. Uh, just setting up in a, in a good random spot in the woods. So that's the only real exception to this. Uh, but once again, if you're going to consistently be successful in the big woods, hunting big woods bucks, you need to be where they are. 
Now, uh, there are four good methods to getting after big bucks in the big woods. Now, I also want to mention this, too. If you have any questions or comments or things in the middle of this time, don't be afraid to be like, eh, I got a question or something that you want to say. So I don't want to just hog the whole time here. So four good methods that we have, the four most effective northern Minnesota hunting strategies. The first one is this, scout for and hunt buck bedrooms. This is going to be the method where you go out in the woods and you just burn the rubber off the boots. You're walking so much. Uh, this is my, one of my favorite styles of hunting is to just get out in the woods, find out where deer are living, and then set up and develop a hunting strategy based off of where those deer are spending their time. And so the one year uh, that I was living up here, I put in about 100 miles walking in the woods in the spring. When I was down in Poplar uh, about two years ago, I put in about 150 miles walking in the woods, just trying to find everything that I possibly could about what deer are doing. And, and so far this year, I think I'm up to like 22 and a half miles or something like that. So we're making it, you know, just slowly just trying to figure out some things, put the pieces of the puzzle together, following rub lines um, and other deer signs. So that's the first effective method to uh, hunting in the big woods. The second one is to sit in a rut funnel every day, all day during the season. You guys, this is actually one of the best methods in the big woods. Uh, because here's the deal. Bucks will get up in the middle of the day after the does have bedded down, and they'll just cruise from doe bedding area to doe bedding area. And if you find the right spot that has all the right features, you can sit in that spot and hunt it day after day after day. And, and a lot of people think, well, you're going you're gonna to ruin that spot. No, because you don't see any deer. Yeah. I mean, the big woods, you don't, you're lucky if you see one deer a day. You're not going to booger a spot if you're doing that. By the time you see a deer, chances are it might be the one that you want to shoot because it's that buck that's cruising. So if you just camp out in one spot, if you're a person that has a lot of patience, that can be an excellent method to hunting in the big woods. Set up in a high odd spot and just stick it out from sunup to sundown. So that's the second one. The third method is food plots and trail cameras. So <clears throat> this one is obviously something that you gotta have some land, you gotta have the availability, the tools, the equipment. This is the most expensive way to do this. Um, but it can be a highly effective thing, especially in the big woods because when you have a highly attractive food source and it's the best food source in the county, you're gonna have a lot of deer hanging out in that area. And so, you almost can get too many deer, too many does, that it pushes the bucks out. They don't want to be there. But if you manage it right and if you do it right, you can have one of the best draws in the area and get a ton of bucks that are coming in. Uh, I think a, a perfect example is a guy like Jeff Sturgis. He, uh, he runs Whitetail Habitat Solutions. And he used to have uh, like 260 acres up in northern Michigan. And he said that the very first year that he owned this property, put out trail cameras, and he got one small little spiker on camera twice the entire season. By the end of those like seven years, seven or eight years that he had that property, he had put in 14 food plots, eight acres total of food plots, and he had 17 different bucks on camera by that time. So you see the power and value of food in a big wood setting like this, where you can have a high quality food that is definitely an effective method and then people that use this they'll put their trail cameras over the food plot and they won't hunt it or hunt near it until they get daylight pictures of a buck in a patternable way and then they go in and they get the buck so that is a, a highly effective method in the big woods the fourth one is to either drive around or walk around and cut a buck track in the snow and then follow the track until you catch up to that buck this is a fun way to hunt. I don't know if you guys have ever tried this before, but this last year, I put, a, I put in a decent amount of effort trying to do this type of hunt in northern Wisconsin, Big Woods area. And I just would drive the roads, drive the roads. Every time I crossed a track that went in the fresh snow, I would look and I would see if it was big enough. Now, generally speaking, you're looking for a track that's going to like, whoa, that's a big track. Okay, because sometimes doe tracks and buck tracks look about the same. 
So you're driving around looking for a track that's pushing three inches wide. Okay, you're looking for a real big track in the snow. And, um, and so I found a track this last year that was, it wasn't quite three inches, but it was a good one. And I went after this buck and um, got, got going, you know, right, it was getting, because I, 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 I started out early and I got on the track before it was light out. And so it's right about light out and I kicked the buck up out of his first bed. And so I just sat there and waited. I measured the bed. It was like a 50 inch bed in the snow. So it's a nice sized deer. Uh, I just waited there, waited there for about 45 minutes to let things kind of settle down. And then I just picked back up on his track and slowly followed him. And once I got about not even a quarter mile away, all of a sudden his feet started to drag in the snow. And I was thinking, at that point, my thought was, oh, usually when they're dragging their feet, that means they're chase, chasing a doe because they got their nose on the ground and they're running like this. But if I would have really known what was going on, that deer was tired and he was starting to drag his feet, which means he's going to bed here soon and you better be ready to get a shot off on that deer. And so I took a couple of steps further thinking I need to pick up the pace to catch up to this deer because he's chasing after a doe. All of a sudden he runs and I'm, I was like 80 yards away from this deer and I didn't even get to see him. Tried tracking him from there on, but I, I didn't have much success. That is a very, very fun way to hunt in the big woods. And honestly, if I was to say as a gun hunter, the most effective way to hunt in the big woods, that's it right there. Uh, because here's the deal. You know at the end of that track, there is a big buck. You're going to where the deer is. You're not sitting over some little spot that you have no idea if a deer is actually there. You're going to a spot where you know that a deer is at the end of that track. And so it puts you in a, in a good situation where you can actually have a chance. Now, does anyone have any questions or thoughts about these four ones that I just shared at all? Anything? Mm -hmm. that's the hard part with this is that you know if if i'm going after a buck in the snow you know there's there's usually two types of people that hunt on tracks there's the still hunter type of person and then there's the actual tracker and a, a still hunter kind of goes to the woods like this and they take a step every 45 minutes and then they take another step and it's like they go unnoticed in the woods you'll never catch up to a buck like that Honestly, with these deer, when you're tracking, you'd be surprised how close they will let you get to them. And if you've got a rifle, you're 50, 60 yards away, you can put a poke at that deer when you're coming up to them. They'll sometimes hear noise and they don't know what it is and they'll be curious and they'll look until they see you and you got split seconds to get a shot off. So when you're actually tracking a buck, you're more looking for what is the what is this deer doing right now? Like I, that example that I just shared, he started dragging his feet. That's when I need to slow down and do the still hunt. Take a step, real slow. Take another step, real slow. So you gotta kinda read the, the, uh, read the sign of what the deer is doing. If you notice that the deer is starting to browse on a few things here and browse on a few things there, it's probably gonna bed down soon. It's probably really close to you. Um, if you start to notice that there's like a J hook when they're walking, if, they, if all of a sudden their path just swerves, you better start looking because they're probably within a couple of yards of you. So there's all these things that you're looking for, but you actually have to go on the track fairly quickly. You ha cause, because a buck that's six miles ahead of you, you're, you're not going to catch unless you're moving. And you don't know how long ago that buck was there when he left that print in the snow. So you got you to get going. You got to move. Um, they cover a lot of ground up here in the big woods. Any, there was another question that was. Yes. Yep. Yes. That is a great point. In fact, that was my biggest struggle this year when I was trying to track these bucks. Is that, uh, uh, for example, there was a different deer that I was tracking and I got going on the track and within 200 yards of getting into the woods, 
it went into an absolute mess of deer tracks everywhere. And you're sitting there like, <sighs> doing circles. all, And I still couldn't figure out whatever happened. I ended up just getting so discouraged, I left the track. And, and so that is one of the challenges. You almost are better off tracking bucks in an area where you know there's not very many deer because that's gonna give you your best chance. But if, you, if you're following a track and you get into an area where there's a mess of tracks, you're just gonna have to make a big circle, loop around, and try to find that track coming out of there somewhere. And once you find it exiting, then you, then you keep going on it. Any other thoughts? I've found it helps a lot in this country where you have hills. Mm. I come over the hill real slow. Yes. And then I run mm. when I determine he's not there. Yep. Yeah, then you, can, then you can keep that pace going on them, uh, but yet still set yourself up good. And a lot of times, which is something that we're going to, we won't talk a whole lot about it in this time, but uh, a lot of times those bucks are going to be bedded on ridges or on points or on high areas. Now, one thing I've noticed, though, about this area when I hunted it, there's not a whole lot of terrain change. Not until you get out, like, I mean, like Rainy Lake, that area, there's tons of terrain features, and it's just, but, you know, basically anything this way and south, I mean, you're lucky to get a hill that's maybe 10, 15 feet high. I mean, it's, there's just not much terrain change. So I didn't, I didn't plan a whole lot to talk about buck bedding with terrain features that are, uh, you know, elevation changes. But if you do find a pocket like that, you can find that, that, that a buck would be bedded in that type of area. Um, and that, that can be pretty effective. So we're going to um, keep going here. Now, I don't have time to talk about all of these four methods. So there's one that I really want to dive into, and it's the first one. It's the scouting one. Um, and so <laughs> scouting for and hunting buck bedrooms. Uh, now, the first question to look at is this. When is the best time to go walk in the woods? I was planning to say that it would be right now, but you guys have like a foot of snow on the ground. So usually the best time to walk is, uh, you know, once the snow's melted and you can see the ground. Because here's the deal, like in the fall, bucks leave their sign. They rub on trees, they scrape on the ground, they leave sign all over the place. And when, when the snow covers over it, you can't see all of that sign. You can see some of the rubs, so that means you can still do some scouting when there's, uh, when there's snow on the ground. And I, I still scout with tons of snow on the ground. I would be out walking in this, no problem. But the best scouting is going to be once that snow is melted enough and you can see the ground, you can see everything and piece the whole puzzle together. Um, so what I would suggest, if you're a person who's interested in implementing this method into your hunting, um, and, and it's also great for all the other forms of hunting too, and it, it, will, it will help those, but is when, when this, yeah, I would start getting out in the woods anytime now and just start walking. Go to a public land area that you know about or maybe you've got a piece of property that you own. Get out and walk it. And oftentimes, this is something that I've noticed is that if we hunt a piece of property for long enough, we have our systems of the way we like to hunt it. And a lot of times, deer figure us out. And you need to go back in and re-scout that property. And sure enough, you move over 100 yards to this area. And next thing you know, you end up shooting a buck. I think of Megan. She shot, you know, it was like after that seminar, you guys changed up a few things. She goes and shoots a nice 125-inch buck the next year. So sometimes that's what has to happen is we just got to get out into the woods a little bit and check things out and see what's happening. So that's the best time of year to do it is about right now on through the time of green up. Once it starts, once the leaves start to get on the trees, uh, you're not going to be able to uh, see the sign as well. And it's also just thick and nasty and mosquitoes. Ugh. The second thing here, what should you be looking for when you are out scouting? What type of sign should you pay attention to? I'm paying attention, first of all, to rubs. Now, um, as a buck is walking through the woods, he usually has a certain path that he likes to travel. Now, obviously, they do wander a little bit, but for the most part, all the GPS collars, everything shows that bucks kind of have a consistent pattern of what they do. In the big woods, it can be challenging because it's spread out a little bit more, but they do have a certain pattern that they will follow. 
And so as that buck is walking and he's doing his thing, he's going to stop at a tree and he's going to rub on that tree. And then he's going to move on to the next tree. And a little bit later, he's going to feel like, ah, I feel like rubbing again. So then he's going to rub on that tree. So you can take these rubs in a line and you can follow it. And, and the other part of it too is this. If, say this is a tree and he comes and rubs on this tree, he's going to rub on the side that he is coming from. So if, I, if he approaches the tree, he's going to rub it on this side. Sometimes you'll get them kind of weird and you know, you'll have even on both sides sometimes. But for the most part, you can tell that a buck is going in a certain direction based off of the rub that he has on that side. And I like to find these and then piece them together. I find this rub here, I'll mark it on my phone on the satellite image, I'll go a little bit further, mark it on my phone again, go a little bit further, mark another one that I find. And, um, and this can be very beneficial to figuring out where a deer is going. Now, the ultimate goal of following a rub line is this. You are trying to find where that buck is bedding. I don't follow rub lines just because I feel like following rub lines and knowing where the deer travels. I want to know where is this deer spending the majority of his time? Where is he going to be at most of the time? Because once again, it comes back to this point. You want to hunt a buck where he is, not where he was. Okay, I don't care if he's, his rub line goes out three quarters of a mile this way. That's great to know. It's great to know where he's going to this slashing to feed or if he's going to this person's alfalfa field to feed. That's great knowledge to have, but that's not where I'm going to be able to kill that deer in daylight or see that deer in daylight. I need to get back to where he is spending his time in daylight, where he is. Okay, So... <clears throat> If you're a half mile from a buck's bedroom, you won't see that deer unless it's the rut and that buck is cruising doing something. Uh, you guys, this is, this is something that when I first started hunting up here, this was a mistake that I made, is I'd find a spot and there was a bunch of rubs, there was a good sign that all came together and I thought, wow, this is a good spot to hunt. I'd throw a trail camera up there, I'd get big bucks coming through, I'm all excited, and then I go in and I try to hunt it and I see absolutely nothing. Well, if a buck is not bedded very close to that area, you're probably not going to see him. Now, uh, if, if any of you guys have ever heard of the hunting beast, it's, uh, it's a, there's this guy, Dan Infault, that's starting the hunting beast, and he focuses and specializes on buck bedding. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to be sharing with you is based off of what Dan Infall talks about. And the principles are true in the big woods as well as in other areas that people hunt. And Dan Infault says, if you're not within 100 yards, at a most 150 yards from a bedded buck, you probably don't have a chance at that deer. They move very limited amounts in daylight. Uh, a perfect example of a time when I had uh, an encounter like that was um, uh, I was <clears throat> hunting this buck called Sapling. I had a picture of it earlier. I think I, I'll have to maybe pull it up again. But he was that eight-pointer, you know, like 125. He was pretty similar to, to, to Macho Man, this buck that I shot there. Um, and so this buck, uh, I was hunting in a spot, and I was probably 250 yards away from his bedroom. And I didn't know it at the time that his bedroom was 120, uh, 250 yards away. Otherwise, I would have moved closer to it. But he's, I, I'm getting out of my stand at the end of the night because I didn't see anything. And I'm walking back out, headed towards where his bedroom was, and then I was going to cut out this way. Um, and so I'm walking back this way, and all of a sudden, I got a whiff of that smell of a big buck. I don't know if you guys have ever smelled what a big buck smells like, but it's undeniable. It is the nastiest, foulest smell you've ever smelled. Basically, it's a buck that pees on his legs all the time and rubs it together and then just lets the stank get nasty, okay? It's gross. And so I smelled that, and it's dark out. I smelled that, and no more than a second or two later, whoosh, I heard him blow, and he goes and runs off. Now, if I would have been within 100 yards of his bedding area, I probably would have had a shot at that deer, or at least seen it. But where I'm 250 yards away, only 250 yards away from a bedded buck, and I had zero chance at getting that deer because he's not coming that far in daylight. 
So uh, another example that I have is that there was a buck that I, uh, I set up a stand this year in a spot where um, it was overlooking a slashing and I thought that there would be some bedding out in this slashing. And sure enough, I, I actually hung a stand on public land. I put the stand up, strapped the deer stand on, climbed into the deer stand. I'm doing this all really quietly because I, I didn't want to spook anything that would be out in the, in the slashing. And I climb up in and I get my camera arm set. Everything's ready. I get turned around and I look and there was a buck bedded 69 yards out in front of me. I set up a deer stand 69 yards in front of a bedded buck by just being stealthy and I had good enough cover in front of me that he couldn't see me. And so I ended up getting to watch this buck the rest of that night. And it was interesting because he did not get more than 50 yards from his bed by the time it was dark. What chance does somebody have hunting a quarter mile away on a buck like that? What chance does a person hunting 200 yards have, away, have on a buck like that? There is no advantage there. You need to be so close to that deer that you feel like if I take another step, he's going to bust out of here. That's how close you need to be to that deer. Once again, you need to be where the buck is. Not where he was, not where he's going. You need to be where he is. So uh, another couple things that I also pay attention to when it comes to rub is where is it in relation to bedding? If I know a buck is bedding right on the edge of a marsh or he is bedding on an island in a marsh or he's bedding up on a little knob, it, it, may, it pays no, like I, I shouldn't even hardly pay attention to a rub that's a quarter mile away from that. Really doesn't matter unless it's just for the purpose of knowing where that deer's traveling. The second thing that I'm looking for is the height of the rub. And I actually have a picture of this. If you look at this rub here that I found out in the woods, see where my finger is pointing? That's a tine mark. That's up at shoulder height. You guys, little bucks do not get rub marks that high on a tree. That's an owl. <laughs> it looks like an elk, but that's actually a deer. And, uh, um, and so what I'm looking for when I approach a rub, ones that are really going to get my attention are if I find a rub that's, you know, the actual part of the rub that's scarred up on the tree, if it's up over my waist... That's a nice deer, okay? The other thing, too, is if I find tine marks that are poked upwards of, you know, like chest height or higher, my dad has found rub, which poke marks on trees up above his head. They get on their back legs and they just thrash, okay? So this is definitely one of the biggest things that I'm looking for when I'm in the woods is I am looking for tall rubs. I know we all come up to these trees that are just shredded and they look just nice and it's like, whew, that's got to be a big buck. It could be a big buck, but if it's only this far off the ground, if it's at knee height, there's, it might be a nice buck, might not be. That's why you need to keep following those rub lines to see what is the pattern. And if you see a pattern of they're all small rubs, that's probably a little basket eight. If it's down low, it's either a spike, a yearling, deer, a yearling buck, or a two and a half year old buck. And so I'm looking for big, tall, high ones that are going to really get my attention. Does the size of the stick matter? Size of stick does not matter at all. Uh, a lot of people think that you need to have this, you know, tree the size of your thigh, and that's 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 when you're going to find a big buck. That buck that I told you guys, sapling, the story I was telling you about, I called him sapling because all he would rub on was these little little thin shoots. He he'd hardly rubbed on anything big. And but the biggest thing that you're looking for, if you find a little stick, and and he's been rubbing on the stick. Look for ones that are snapped off. Because what that means is that buck was rubbing and he's got enough force on his neck and he's got big enough antlers that he can get that, that stick intertwined and then <clears throat> and snap it. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been in the woods and you're trying to clear a lane and you forgot your little handsaw. Have you ever tried to rip up one of those little saplings? It's like, you can't do it, okay? But you, you look at a buck and he can get a hold of that little sapling and literally rip it in half. That's a deer that's got some force. That's a deer that's very strong. So that would be a, a significant of a, a, you know, a way that you could know that it is a mature buck. That's a great question. Great, great, great point. Another thing that I'm looking for, guys, when I look at a rub, 
is I believe that you can actually tell what time of year the buck made that rub. Now, I, I didn't have the perfect picture to show you, but I do have this here. And if you look at this rub, this one, this one, this one might be even a little bit too old, but I, I wanted to illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. If you look at the base, it might be hard to see. You see the little splotches around the base of that rub? Now, one of the things that I'm looking for when I come up to a rub, if you find these fresh polished trees and there's none of them look like there's, and there's no splotches on any of them, there's no discoloration at all, that generally means that that buck was there during the rut for a little short period of time because of the does or whatever. Maybe he's bedding or living in that area for that specific time, but then he moves on. When I'm out in the woods... I get real excited when I find rubs that they still look fresh from this last year, but they're starting to show signs of aging. And the reason why this happens is that in September, early season, uh, what is happening then is that it's still the growing season. So that tree is still growing. And as a buck rubs its antlers on a tree in September, that, that will uh, you know, scar the tree but the tree is still growing, so it starts to heal itself a little bit. And, and if, you get a, if you get like a year or two later down the road, that, that scar becomes completely gray. Like that would be completely gray. And you wouldn't even hardly be able to tell that it was made. Um, now you've got to be careful because sometimes they can be a little bit deceiving. You know, this one, I, I think that this one was a little bit too far gone. Usually I'm looking for one that looks like it's still fresh, but there's just a couple bubbles showing up on the base of it, little, little blotches. And what that'll end up, uh, you know, um, what, I'm, what I'm excited about when I see that is then I know that that buck is there early season. And then what really gets me excited is if I find those early season rubs and those rut rubs in the same place. Because that means that deer's there the whole time. He's spending a lot of his time the whole year in that spot. So that's something that I really like to look for when I'm out in the woods. And it's kind of been a new revelation of mine as I've been walking around and trying to just piece together what I've been seeing. So pay attention to that kind of stuff. What are you seeing with the rubs themselves? Um, now, <clears throat> where should you look? If you're going to scout, if you're going to scout for a big buck, where should you spend your time? So the big woods is daunting. It's kind of scary. It's like, wow, there's, there's a lot of it. So what I'm looking for is edge, 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 and more edge. Okay? There has to be something to channel those deer to a certain area in the big woods, and edge is where it's at. And what I mean by that is uh, where the, the habitat of the woods changes, dramatically changes. So like on an edge of a swamp, on the edge of a marsh, uh, the edge of a slashing, um, maybe there was a blowdown in a certain area and there's an edge that's created around that blowdown. Um, any, uh, any other thoughts? What? Edge of a pasture, edge of fields, okay? You gotta be looking at all these areas where there is a sudden and distinct habitat change. Now sometimes they're subtle. You might not notice it, but you'll know when you get there because all of a sudden there's sign. You guys, I spend almost all of my time in the woods on an edge. If you guys are walking through a big block of timber and you're like, I'm just going to hunt in the middle of this thing, good luck. It'll be just by sheer luck that you have a chance that you're actually going to see a buck or get a chance at a buck. You need to be on an edge, okay? And so... Um, <clears throat> I'll show you guys a couple examples here uh, of what I'm looking for. So a downwind edge of a slashing, if you guys can see that white line, that's the edge of the slashing. Now there's a couple spots that I would first of all pay attention to. If a buck is going to be bedded in a slashing, generally speaking, he is going to be on the downwind edge of it. So if the wind is blowing this way across the slashing, He's probably going to be on this, on this bottom end of the slashing, either right on the edge or just inside of the thick, nasty stuff. If the wind is blowing upwards in this direction, I would be interested in that upper portion up there, that little spot right up there. 
Uh, so what I would do, if I was to look at a slashing like this and I was going to say, I'm going to hunt this thing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to walk the entire edge of that thing. You don't even really need to step into the slashing. Just walk the edge of it and take note of where you see rubs. Are they going into the slashing, out of the slashing? Are they going into one corner? Uh, you know, oftentimes I'll find uh, like, a, like 15, 20 rubs in one little area. And then you won't hardly find any rubs for like 300 yards. And then you'll find another little patch of them. And so I'm paying attention to where those spots where there are high concentrations of rubs because chances are a buck might be bedding there. Another interesting thing about edges like this is that that is your best place to find sheds. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed some of these sheds that we have found here, but every single one of these sheds were found on an edge. And I found this buck here. Uh, this is actually an International Falls buck that I found, a dead buck that I found up here. This one I found right on an edge. This one here, this is actually a uh, shed antlers that dropped and I just mounted on that flat. I found them dropped right next to each other. It was five yards from the edge of a slashing. So if you want to find sheds, you need to be where the deer are spending time. And where the deer are spending time is right on an edge. So I like to be right around slashings. Uh, that, is, that is one of my preferred places to hunt, is right, I mean, like, right on the edge of a slashing. Uh, okay, so, <clears throat> another thing that I've also noticed, too, is sometimes if you find a little island of trees, of mature trees out in a slashing, sometimes if you go out there, you'll find a bunch of rubs in and around that island of trees, and oftentimes that can be where a buck is bedding because they, they have the safety and security of the entire slashing all around them, uh, and they've got food there, uh, and they just kind of hang out in that spot and spend a lot of time bedding there. Another thing is I've noticed, you see that little peninsula of trees right there towards the bottom? And even that one that's a little further up, but I really like that, that small one there. I'll like to walk those edges because oftentimes uh, if a buck is bedded, he might be out on that point and, um, and he might have the wind coming from the timber this way into the edge of that point. And so he can smell anything coming from behind him, and he's looking out into the slashing. Um, oftentimes, though, uh, you know, you might find it the opposite way, where the wind is blowing across the slashing can, since they can't see into the slashing, and then they will look out into the open timber in front of them. So this is definitely a, a, a really good one. I actually found a shed one time, just this, this last fall I was walking, and there was a peninsula kind of like that one, and I was walking on it and I found a scrape and then I took a couple steps further and I looked and there was a little shed. And so that deer was probably bedding right on a peninsula of mature trees right like that right on the edge of a slashing. So look for those kinds of things. Another thing, marshes and swamps. You guys know how I, I talked about uh, um, that buck sleeping giant? This is actually a, an island that I believe that he was bedded on. Now, if you see the white line here, that is the edge of the mature timber. And that white line around that little patch of trees that sticks up, that little clump of trees, they love to bed out on these islands. And here's a really cool thing. I, want you, I don't know if you guys will be able to see it on the screen because it's, it's uh, kind of dark. Do you guys see all those black lines going across the screen from the island up to the corner? You guys see those? Those are deer trails. So you know what you can do? You can pull up your satellite image, pull up Google Maps, put it on satellite imagery, look at your swamp, and you can see every single deer trail going through your swamp. And swamps are a little tougher to find, but marshes are marshes where it's grassier type of stuff, cattails, uh, swamp brush. You can pull up your satellite image and see all of the deer trails going to this island. This buck was clearly headed out to that island. Look at all of those trails going in and out of that area. So that's a really cool feature, something that you can spend a lot of time. Just get on Google Maps, pull it up, and you can, you can see. So once again, that was this buck that was bedded out on that island. Now, um, this spot here that I hunted up north here, uh, this is the one where I had Dreamer. He was bedding, and I followed his rub line out to these points. Oh, that's really dark. Followed him out to these points, and there was kind of like a beaver slough up out this way. 
So I've talked about islands. Buck love to bed on islands out in a marsh and on the edge of and in a swamp. But they also like to bed on points going out into marshes. So if you look at that line, you see that white line makes a little jut, then it makes a little jut on those points. That's where you're going to find a lot of bedding. And that buck that I, the dreamer, I tracked his rub line all the way right to those points. And sure enough, he was bedded right there. And in fact, this spot where I got that picture of him, this one here, that came through at 5.30 a.m. in the morning and he was walking straight to that point. Now, here's another thing that's crazy to think about. It's still dark out. And he's 100 yards from his bed going to bed. That's the challenge that you face in the deer woods is you have about this much space to get after a deer uh, in daylight, legally. <clears throat> this is another example of what I would be looking for. This was actually just a random picture that I pulled up out by like Shay Shay or something like that. I just randomly looked at it. Look at all those deer trails going out to that island. You see that? There's deer probably bedding right out on that island. And that's, there's like cattails and brush and all sorts of stuff there. That peninsula right there leading out, that point leading out into the marsh, there's probably deer bedding on that. There's probably bedding right up on that little point right there. Okay, But there's all these trails kind of converging and coming right to those islands. So pay attention to that. You can scout out an entire area without ever even having to put your boots on the ground. Just pull up your satellite and you can see what you have. Um, so, the last part of this, how to hunt it. You need to be close, 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 close to the bedding where you feel like if you take another step, you are going to bust that deer out. If you're not busting deer out of their beds, you're not getting close enough. You should every once in a while bust a deer out of its bed because you're getting that close to it. Um, so, if I was to hunt this situation, I would probably... Um, Usually if the island is a little bit bigger, I might try to sneak out on that island, but you have to have a just off wind. Or like, sometimes on islands, the deer, the deer will just bed out on those islands where the wind doesn't really matter a whole lot. But on the peninsula, uh, that point right there, if the wind is blowing this way, that's when they're gonna generally be sitting right on the end of that point, okay? So if I was to sit and try to hunt a buck that was bedding on that point, I would probably go back just about 60, 70, 80 yards, and I would have my wind blowing just past him. Okay, I don't want my wind blowing right to him because he's going to booger me. I want my wind blowing just past him, and then, and then I can uh, wait until he gets up and walks to me that final little bit. Um, so if, if this island, if he was out on that island, then I would be right on the tip of the point there waiting for him to come across uh, from the island to the main ground. So if the island was a little bit bigger, I would be out on the one end of the island waiting for him to come to me on that island. So it's really a challenge to get that close, uh, but it is possible, as I just shared that story about setting up, a, I set up a deer stand 69 yards away from that bedded buck. So it is possible, but it's not easy, and you gotta have enough cover where when he's laying in his bed, he doesn't see the movement because the brush is so thick or whatever. So you don't want to get above his line of sight or else he's going to be like, what's that? And then he'll be out or he'll stay there and won't even leave his bed. So that is how I would hunt that. On, the, on a slashing, on the downwind edge, I would try to get to where his rub line either exits or enters on that slashing and be as close as possible to his bedroom. So... Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was the information that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, you know, you just simply got to be putting your boots on the ground. And I hope that these tips and this knowledge that I share with you guys, that it, that it honestly helps uh, some of you. And so uh, I wanted to open it up just for a few questions. Just, I, we probably are running out of time here soon, right? Okay. So, um, so if you guys have any questions or thoughts or anything, now would be the time. Yes. And the main thing there is when, and then also getting in there in the dark right yep. ahead of time. Um, and a lot of the where I hunt, they slipped in with that down like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But you can get in close, and you're not making any noise, and mm -hmm. get in there in the dark, you yep. have a good chance of killing a big buck. The edge is the best thing on slack. 
Right on the end. Yep. yep. That's where that's where you're gonna find almost all the rubs, yeah. all the sign, yeah. all the deer, right on that edge. That's that's a good point. Anything else? Well then another thing, when the deer when the deer are in the rut, I have a spot that um, they come off the fields up north and they come down into our country. And what a lot of people think is they gotta get on the runway in that area. Well, the big bucks when they're in the rut, they like to go against the grain. Every runway, yep. across. they go across it. They go across it what they do. Yep, so the trails are going to the food source. So if this yep. is the food source, trail's going here, he runs this way across to cut every and doe trail. Every time he gets a runway, he's checking this stuff. Yep. You, you got to find that runway though, yep. which is. Well, that's part of that scouting. Yep. You're talking about yep. That if you, and if you find those rubs crossing that, boy, you better set up right there and be there the whole rut. That's great. Any other thoughts? I have a question. What's the name of the big buck you're watching now? <laughs> uh, I have quite a few, actually. Uh, usually, usually, I have the amount of shooter bucks I have on camera per year is anywhere from 15 to 20. So just because of the different areas that I'm scouting out, and I got them all figured out, and I put out a bunch of cameras. But... Here's the deal, just because you have it on camera doesn't mean a hill of beans. Cameras only tell you that the deer is there and what the deer looks like. It doesn't put them on your wall for you. So you gotta, be, you gotta hunt smart and actually do it the right way. Any other thoughts? How big a score do you consider a shooter? 125 is usually, but you know, this buck here that I shot last year, um, he fooled me. I, I thought he was about a 130 inch buck and he's actually 115. But you know, when he's coming through the woods and those antlers look nice and you get fired up, you're like, it's going down, okay? So uh, I, I try to shoot for Pope and Young, 125 inch buck, but that's still a, an amazing deer and I'm proud of that deer and I would never want to do any disservice to that deer because I took its life, you know? So. Uh, you know, that's an incredible deer that I will always be proud of. Um, but, you know, that's kind of that's kind of what I'm shooting for. But, you know, ultimately, I, I would like to get to the point where I, I'm shooting, you know, 150, 160 inch bucks, at least 140. But, you know, I got to get a few under my belt, <laughs> uh, get a few successes before I, I just limit myself just to that. So I'm really trying to uh, you know, take every opportunity I can at a mature deer. I'm looking more for age class, uh, you know, four and a half year old or older. This one was probably a three and a half year old, uh, but four and a half year old is what I'm usually shooting for. Any other thoughts or questions? Do you bow hunt? Yes, bow hunting is that is where I spend pretty much uh, most of my time. Um, yeah, I I love bow hunting, so. Any other thoughts or questions? I got one story to tell about how far a big buck can go. Yeah. Um, Greg Sears got a big buck uh, in Birchdale that scored 180 something. And it had been seen three days before, 10 miles on the Black River Road, spotted. He traveled 10 miles through the big swamp between. The Black River Road and Birchdale. Jeez. So that's how far those deer can travel during the rut. That is incredible. Yeah. And it really surprised me because I used to think, yeah, maybe a couple of miles or something. They stretch it out. But they stretch it out too. So yep. I just thought I'd run that, you know, I mean, it was 10 miles like three days before. So. And, and think about this if you're tracking a buck and he's cruising like that, because you guys can hunt during the rut. You get in, and if you get some fresh snow and you find a track and you're, if you just are moseying along, you're never going to catch a buck that's 10 miles away. I mean, you probably won't ever catch a buck that's 10 miles away, but, but, you know, that's the kind of challenge that you're going to face up here is with the expanse. And these bucks, they know where the does are. They, he's probably run that circuit the last three years of his life. When he came to maturity, he was running that big circuit. And, and he would do the same. He'd only do it maybe once or twice a whole year. But you, you know, chance, like for some people, that's when they get lucky 
and they're in the right spot at the right time. And ultimately, you guys, a lot of this comes down to you have to be lucky. But the things that I'm telling you here are ways that are going to help increase your odds and give you the best chance so that you can be uh, um, giving yourself the best chance to be able to see a deer in daylight. Um, I always like to tell the story about uh, the rough changes that we did. Yes. I mean, when that dog's coming, they ask us to move the buck. They yep. lose it. Uh, They're hard to pattern. That's why every once in a while, some little kid will shoot the spare game off the buck. Mm hmm. And the reason we did it because that buck would run through the woods after it goes. Yep. Most likely. Yep. But I always like to tell people that. If a doe is in heat and the buck is further, she can go lay down in the Walmart parking lot and she'll be right there. <laughs> yep, it's true. Oh, you, you'd be surprised at some of the places you would see a buck chasing after a doe. Um, obviously in the big woods is a little bit harder because we don't, you know, we don't get to see the deer as much because there's so much woods, but like you go down to Iowa and these bucks will chase does out into the middle of a wide open field and sit there out in the middle of a field and won't let that doe go anywhere, you know? I mean, it's really interesting. And, and that's why it, it does become hard to pattern a buck and get on him during the rut because he's cruising, he's doing different things and, and we don't know everything that that buck is gonna do. And, and they're wild creatures. They can do whatever they want, okay? So that's the other part of it too. Did you have something you're gonna say? Hunt the does during the rut. That's, that's the key. And I think of Bryce right now. He had a spot that he just nailed him like that. Oh, every year, all those bucks he's got, man. He just, he hunt the doe bedding, and every night they'd come out. Not every night, but it's a little exaggeration. But, but he's got it. He had it figured out. That, that was a, that's the key to hit a lot of his success is that, that doe bedding. So any other thoughts? Okay, I'm going to just close with this final little thing here, guys. I wanted to tell you guys, first of all, this is my YouTube, uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I have this, uh, what I've started, uh, YouTube, a hunting show called Stillwater Outdoors. I have a number of videos uh, up on, on uh, my YouTube page. And uh, I've got much more content coming. In fact, I've got a couple hunts that are just about fully edited from this last fall. You're going to get to see the hunt. For that buck right there that'll be coming up here this fall um, so I've got a lot of that and I just wanted to mention about the name Stillwater Outdoors uh, if you didn't know um, there's a, a verse in the Bible from Psalm 23 that the Lord leads me beside still waters uh, it's a place of rest and um, and I want to take that that title as the name for um, my hunting show because uh, I believe in the importance of, first of all, the rest that God gives us as we experience his creation, but also the, the spiritual rest that he gives us through Jesus Christ. So I'm hoping that you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and that you know him as your Lord and Savior because we get to experience his creation when we do this. So thank you guys. Let's go.